it turns out that many of you have asked just how this stupidity happens. And I'm not going to be able to give you a full answer to that, okay? But what I can do is uh, I'll, I'll cut to some B-roll. Um, right? So, so, oh, look at that. Here we are. Oh, fancy. I feel like I'm in an Apple commercial right now. And, and so uh, I just wanted to, some of you have been asking, like, what, do, what, what does it look like? Right. And so what it looks like basically is absolutely nothing. It looks like me in some athletic shorts so that I don't sweat my butt off too much and a stupid camera. That's you. You're the camera. That's you right there. Can you believe it? That's you. And, you know, there's like a stupid microphone that's on a stupid boom arm that's held up by books that I'm never going to read, like the Shakespeare complete works. And then if you just sort of keep spinning, there's some random light that I never use. And there's a dingy, right? There's the thing that makes my shoulder look funny. There's a pile of books that I read but need to file. And then, you know, you know the rest, you know this part of the set pretty well. And then there's a door, and then we're back to you, which is really where I'd rather keep the focus. But uh, I hope that this quick little tour has let you know that there's nothing particularly special to what's happening right now. All that's special is the fact that we're talking about game theory, which is pretty badass, right? So... Um, if nothing else, I, this is something that you could do way better than I could. I have precisely no idea what I'm doing, um, but it's a lot of fun anyway, and I hope it's been fun for you too. Uh, and so I'm going to stop talking now and say, hey, let's go talk about some game theory. Hey, let's go talk about some game theory. Hey everybody, welcome to PS231. So in the previous lecture, we introduced the notion of time to our book of fables by talking about the time-respecting fables that are introduced through extensive form games. Prior to that, we had been working with simultaneous move games where the players weren't able to observe, weren't able to react, weren't able to learn, weren't able to condition. And now, once we've introduced time, we've seen that there's all sorts of different ways that we can use time to play around with those particular concepts. Of course, on the problem set, we covered none of that. On the problem set, we took extensive form games and converted them to simultaneous move games and studied them the old way. I did that just to make sure that you could see the linkages between the old way and the new. But it doesn't make any sense for us to introduce time into our models unless we're planning on using time in the analysis, right? What's the point of taking a tree, turning it into a matrix, and then studying it like it was a matrix the entire time? What's the punchline? What's the payoff? What do we get out of doing things this way? If we believe that time is an important part of political processes, then the breath of life that we breathe into our fables, the equilibrium concept, the proposed behavior, the hypothesized behavior, that has to account for that time as well. And so that's what we're going to talk about today. Today we'll be taking where we were with simultaneous move games where Nash equilibrium is the primary method of analysis, and we'll be refining that into something called subgame perfect equilibrium. Boy, if you don't crush every dinner party when I'm done with you, you're just never going to crush a dinner party. Subgame perfect equilibrium is going to be our concept that allows us to, to let time be an important part of what we mean by collective rationality. It's the way that we're going to think about aggregation of preferences. You know, there's all sorts of big lessons to learn from studying subgame perfect equilibrium, but I think the single biggest one is that what happens in the future, whether it's a real future or a hypothetical future, has to reinforce what happens in the past. We'll see actually that the way that one studies simple games like this is to use an algorithm for finding subgame perfect equilibria called the backward induction algorithm, where we look ahead to all the possible futures, we look way ahead. Oh my God, look at that. Woo! We look way ahead to all the possible futures, and then we, we figure out what would have happened there if everybody was behaving as if rational. Nash behavior, you know, choose the best thing, nothing too hard. And then we look through all those futures, and then the people in the that make the initial decisions look down the tree, figure out what's gonna happen. They say, well, if I if somebody made me a promise today, I have to look into the future to see if they're actually gonna want to live up to that promise. If somebody made a threat to me today, I have to look into the future to see if they're actually gonna live up to that. 
If the incumbent tells me not to run for office, I have to look into the future to figure out if they're actually going to campaign. I have to look ahead. I have to look ahead. I have to see which threats, which promises, which things in the future are credible, which things are actually believable, which things are sequentially rational, which things make as much sense tomorrow as they do today. You don't need math for this. You don't need game theory for this. We've all broken a promise, if we're being honest with ourselves, and we've all had many promises broken. Why did we listen to the promise today? Why didn't we look down the tree? Well, sometimes we can't, and sometimes we can. And actually, I think that subgame perfection is a good tool for introspection when you think about keeping promises, making promises that you can keep as opposed to promises that you can't keep. And we'll be focusing on stuff like that moving forward, particularly once we introduce incomplete information, which we're not to yet. Now that today is the present instead of the future that it had been back when we were talking about this in week nine, even though today is also going to be the past once we get to week 11, even though all of those time things are true, we have to do something today. We have to do something today. We have to talk about something today. We have to do a lecture today. We have to do some game theory today. Today, 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 today. So today I want you to go get yourself a beverage. Today I want you to get yourself comfortable. Today I want you to get yourself a fresh notebook and a fresh pen so that you feel really smart. Today I want you to get yourself completely locked in because this is one of those lessons that's going to stick with you if you take a game theory class. So let's get to it. In the A block, we'll just do the backward induction algorithm on candidate entry. We will see exactly how to take where we were with Nash equilibrium and exploit the time structure that lives in a game tree. You'll see that not all Nash equilibria are subgame perfect, whereas all subgame perfect equilibria are indeed Nash. It's a refinement. We're going to shrink the predictions. Okay. That's our goal. We, we like to have simple, straightforward, unique predictions. We like to use the f time in order to take what had been a potentially very indeterminate set of predictions and refine it into a smaller set of credible ones. That's, that's the enterprise. That's what we're trying to do here. And you're like, oh, I'm glad it was something. I wasn't sure. Once we're done learning what the backward induction algorithm is about in a simple context, in the B block, we'll make things a little bit more complicated by studying the ultimatum game via backward induction. It'll be a good chance for us to talk about bargaining again, and we'll see that bargaining has a very particular flavor once we've imposed the time structure. I'll show you that the ultimatum game goes from what had been a morass of equilibria, an embarrassment of equilibria in the simultaneous version that we studied on the problem set, and we'll take that and we'll find a sharp prediction. We'll, we'll take what had been very fuzzy and make it sharp. That said, the sharpness of the prediction might be something that rubs you the wrong way, and so we'll use the opportunity to talk about how one might get stronger in bargaining and what benefits that might confer. When we're done with all that, then over in the C block, I want to talk about the rule of law, not just because it's kind of important, but also because the rule of law game allows us to talk about how to do subgame perfection when we have information sets. You'll see there's a, a new rule that we use in backward induction. It's not very hard. It just means that we have to do a little bit of matrix style analysis, and then we get to play with all the equilibria in those. Apparently, this is the play with the equilibria hand gesture. So we get, to, we get to begin from something that had been pretty complicated and then think through the possibilities in a creative way, which is very good news because you're more creative than you think that you are. You're better at political analysis than you probably think that you are. I hope that you feel like you're better at game theory than you were before, but I also hope that you feel like you're better at informal arguments than you were before. Right? So having an object to play with makes things really fun. You needed me for that. So let this be a place where your creativity really begins to kick in because there's a lot more craft to the analysis. And that's going to be something that continues the rest of the way. Nash, very, very computational, very, very robotic. But as we proceed, there's going to be something a little bit more artistic to what we do, which is great news because we're living exactly at the intersection of what is beautiful, what is useful, and what is rigorous. So I have nothing else to say because that's about the DNA of this class as there is. So let's get started. I know what you're thinking. Does he mean the 1980s or the 2080s? It's a reasonable question, but I think the answer depends on how well you do in this block, don't you? Well, now that we've ruined it by making this seem awfully weighty in the A block, we're going to talk about candidate entry. This is actually one of the few episodes that I film after class, right? So, so I, I just got done with, with class with all of you. So I'm, now I'm feeling like super, super happy because we just got a chance to hang out and make, some, make a lot of awful jokes. So let me just re-describe the model of candidate entry as we drew it up before. 
So you remember, the idea here was that once upon a time, there was somebody thinking about running for office. We're gonna call them the challenger or the potential challenger. I guess it's gonna kind of depend. And so the idea is that this challenger is thinking about running for office. And when they go to run for office, um, they're thinking through whether or not the incumbent in their district will run in response. You know, the incumbent is one of these incumbents that's been able to be in office for like 30 years. They haven't really run opposed ever, or they haven't run opposed since, since they could remember. The idea here is that maybe we can compel the incumbent to retire if we enter in, but we don't want to be stuck in some like really nasty political campaign with negative campaign ads or anything like that. And remember, we depict a story of this kind with a game tree. So we'll be moving with strategic time from left to right again. And the idea is at the beginning of time, our friend, the challenger, apparently we're friendly with the challenger, who knew? So the challenger lives right here. And the challenger ha can do one of two things. They can either not run for office or they can run for office. And the idea is if they don't run for office, then there's going to be a status quo outcome as if they never ran for office. Now they're just sitting at home making YouTube videos. I have no thoughts on that or they could run for office. And remember, if the challenger enters into the race, then the incumbent can do one of two things. They can retire and say, hey, thanks for the wonderful idea, challenger. You know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna move myself down to Boca. I'm gonna get myself a giant white Cadillac. I'm gonna start driving at eight miles an hour. I'm gonna wear white pants and a sweater no matter the heat. Or they can run. They can say, you know what? Bring it, whippersnapper. You think you got something just because you know how to use the internet? I know how to campaign on radio, and that's where the voters are. It's a story. I, I, I don't know if this is a good story. I don't study this. So let's put in some utility numbers. Remember, at the status quo, if we're living down here in the world where the challenger hasn't campaigned, if the challenger doesn't enter into the race, zero happiness points for the challenger, one happiness point for the incumbent who gets to stay in office, potentially not doing anything because all day is what they would consider nap time. In. I'm, I'm bringing it hard. If the, if the challenger runs and the incumbent retires, we're going to call that one happiness point for uh, who's the new boss, same as the old boss, and zero happiness points for the now retired Boca living incumbent. And minus one, minus one if they're stuck in the political quagmire of a negative campaign. Now, before we move on to the backward induction, uh, let's just remember that this game can be depicted as if simultaneous. So we can think about the strategic form representation of this extensive form game, right? And that's just a two by two matrix like the ones we've studied before. So remember, we're gonna put the challenger this way and the incumbent this way. So the challenger is the role player and they can either not run for office or they can run for office. And the incumbent can either retire or they can campaign. So long as the challenger doesn't run for office, we wind up at the terminal node of the status quo and that's zero happiness points for the uh, challenger and one happiness point for the incumbent. So I'll put zero one in these two cells. If the challenger runs and the incumbent retires, then that's the situation where the challenger gets the one happiness point for being in office and the incumbent gets the zero happiness points for being in Boca. Boca Raton is a city in Florida. It's lovely. And there's a lot of white Cadillacs there. Finally, if, if the challenger runs and the incumbent runs to minus one, minus one. You'll remember that this game has two pure strategy Nash equilibria. Two pure strategy Nash equilibria. There's the pure strategy Nash equilibrium where the challenger doesn't run and the incumbent campaigns. And there's the other one where the challenger runs and the incumbent retires. And I ask you to reflect on which of those seems like a reasonable prediction to you. And just to put the question a little bit more finely, let's go back to the tree. So I'll name these two equilibria. We'll call the equilibrium where the challenger stays out and the incumbent campaigns, we'll call that the orange equilibrium. And so I'll highlight in orange the edge of not run and the edge of campaign. Notice that we need both of them, right? I mean, we were just at the game where it was simultaneous. Right now you're thinking to yourself, well, why would, why would the incumbent have to campaign? And you'll see why in a second. The other equilibrium, which I'll call the blue equilibrium, is the one where the challenger runs and the incumbent retires. And I want to know which of these two equilibria seems reasonable to you in the context of this time structure and why. Pause the video. Pause the video. You've had a week to prepare, and I still want you to pause the video right now. Pause that video. Hit K or the space bar. I think either of those works. I'm really bad at this. Which seems reasonable, which doesn't? Welcome back. Welcome to the future, actually. It's the future now. 
This is not the future you envisioned for yourself, is it? So let's think through this orange equilibrium. So in the orange equilibrium, the challenger is not running. And then in the purely hypothetical world that we never arrive at, in this, in this dreamland, in this dreamland, the challenger is, is campaigning. And the way you can think about this is the incumbent's campaigning induces minus one happiness points for the challenger. And the challenger is thinking to themselves, well, I don't like that minus one. So if they are going to be campaigning, I would rather stay out. They are deterred. They don't want to enter in. They decide to opt out, not because they like opting out, but rather because they're worried about what will happen if they don't opt out. They're worried about that campaign. They don't want that minus one. Now, let me ask you something. You can turn up your headphones for this if you need to. Why the f*** would the challenger ever think that the incumbent's going to campaign? Why? What do I mean? Look at the incumbent's decision. The incumbent can either retire and get zero or they can campaign and get minus one. And they are the one that decides which of these two outcomes we arrive at. They would never choose to campaign if it came down to it. It's not a credible threat that is deterring the challenger right now. It's not credible. It's not credible because once we get come down to it, if somebody said to the incumbent, hey, go to Boca or get involved with these negative campaign ads, they would take Boca. And given the fact that the incumbent would take Boca, why would the challenger ever think that the incumbent was going to do anything other than go to Boca? I wasn't planning on this particular narrative. I, I recently gave a presentation about my teaching methods and the only question that I got was, what is your theater background? So this doesn't seem to make any sense to me because right now the challenger is saying, well, I'm really worried about this campaign that the incumbent would never choose to do and that's what's making them not enter. That doesn't make any sense. That doesn't make any sense. That doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Why would you ever look down the tree, see something that isn't sequentially rational, and then let that influence how you decide things? You wouldn't. You wouldn't. If I made you a promise that seems absolutely impossible for me to keep, would that change what you did? Like, if I said to you, if you get an A on in this class, I will give you $10 million. Would that change how hard you work? No, I'm not going to keep that promise because I don't have $10 million to give. I'm not going to keep that promise. That shouldn't change how you do anything. That's an incredible promise, the same way that there's an incredible threat of this incumbent running for office. They're going to Boca! Are there any such problems in the blue equilibrium? Let's find out. So in the blue equilibrium, what's happening is the challenger is running and the incumbent is retiring. So that's what the incumbent would rather do there. And given that that's what the incumbent would rather do there, Let's think that through. Right now, the incumbent is doing the sequentially rational thing by retiring. They don't want a campaign. They don't want the minus one. They'll take the zero. And given that, that means that the challenger can either not run and get zero or run and get one. So the challenger is doing what is, what is best for them on the understanding of what would be sequentially rational for the incumbent to do once we got there. That's what we're looking for here. That's how, that's what time does. It means that you can look down the, the tree and find somebody who is decisive at some moment in the future or some group of people that are decisive in the future. Just wait for the C block in the future. And when you look down the tree that way and you think only about the things that would be sequentially rational when we got there, then you'll choose what's best for you on the assumption of sequentially rational play in the future. That's credibility. You only listen to credible threats. You only respond to credible promises. You don't respond to cheap talk. Now, the way that I would frame this is I would say, we've got these two pure strategy Nash equilibria, but only one of them is what we'll call subgame perfect. The blue equilibrium is a subgame perfect equilibrium, whereas the orange equilibrium is not. I'm not gonna bother with super formal definitions of subgame perfect equilibria, although, I mean, they, they exist and there's one in your textbook and everything like that. I just wanna keep your intuitions intuitive right now. So let me show you an algorithm for finding subgame perfect equilibria in simple games like this, and then we'll, we'll, we'll learn more as we go. You, you'll see more as we go. So the name of this algorithm is the backward induction algorithm. So this is the primary way for studying extensive form games 
that have all, terminal nodes, that have all the terminal nodes, that where every sequence of paths leads to some final day, right? Because the idea is we're gonna go to the end and work backwards, which works only if you have an end to work with. Oh my God, go burn a candle. So in its simplest form, backward induction goes like this. Our goal is to take every one of the nodes in the game tree that we see, be they decision or terminal nodes, and our goal is going to be to quote unquote, solve those nodes. Look at me, I'm just fighting off the scare quotes right now. I'm just fighting off the scare quotes. We're gonna quote unquote solve them. We're gonna quote unquote solve them. I'm not gonna let it happen. We're gonna quote unquote solve them. We're gonna solve them. We're gonna solve them. Do, do, do. And it goes like this. So we begin with the terminal nodes. All terminal nodes by definition will be labeled solved. So I will take all three of the terminal nodes in our game and I will put the word solved on them. And in general, what we're gonna do is we're gonna try to find decision nodes that are followed directly only by solved nodes, solve them, and then see if that allows us to solve any other nodes. You're gonna be so tired of the word solve. So we've got two decision nodes left, right? We, we've labeled all three terminal nodes solved and we've got two decision nodes left. The challenger's decision node is followed by the terminal node of the status quo, which is solved by definition, and the incumbent's decision node, which is not solved. It's not, do you see the word solved on this? I don't see the word solved on this. However, if we think about the incumbent's decision node, well, at that decision node, we can wind up at the retirement ending, which is solved, or we can wind up at the campaign ending, which is solved. All of the nodes that follow the incumbent's decision node are solved. So we begin from this node. We hone in on nodes that are followed only by solved nodes. And once we're here, we figure out who is the decision maker here. The incumbent is the decision maker at this decision node. That's why there's an eye on it. And we figure out what they would do here, right? So here they have a choice. They are decisive. Once we've gotten to this moment in time, the incumbent is decisive. They can either retire and wind up with zero happiness points, or they can campaign and wind up with minus one happiness points. Now we know that they would rather do the thing that gets them the, the more happiness points. And so I'm gonna say that they're gonna retire. The incumbent, if it came down to it, if we ever got to this moment in time, the incumbent re would retire. This node is now solved. This node is now solved. Why? Because we know what's gonna happen here. We can take those utility numbers from the ending that we know will happen from the retirement outcome, and we can just put those right underneath the incumbent's decision node because we might as well think of that as a terminal node now because we've thought through what would happen if we got to that contingency. That node is now solved and underneath it lives a one for the challenger and a zero for the incumbent. That node is now solved. That node is now solved. We know what will happen there. We have might as well be utility numbers underneath it. And now we're gonna continue this process. Backward induction continues until all nodes are solved. And right now four of our five nodes are solved. The three terminal nodes are solved. The incumbent's decision node is solved. And now we're just left with the challenger's decision node. So let's hone in on the challenger's decision node. So right now the challenger is thinking to herself, well, I cannot run and wind up making YouTube videos and getting zero happiness points. Or I can run on the understanding that if I run, the incumbent will retire and I will get one happiness point. In other words, I'm choosing between not run and zero happiness points or run and one happiness point. I would rather run. And so I'll highlight the run edge. You will notice that this is exactly the blue equilibrium that we found before, wherein the challenger runs for office and the incumbent retires. This path that begins from the challenger's decision node rides the edge of running for office and then rides the edge of retirement is called the equilibrium path of play. The equilibrium path of play is something that you will be tempted to think of as the equilibrium, but not so. The equilibrium is every decision made by every player at every decision node that they control. It's a complete contingency plan over every decision node. It's just that that's a very trivial enterprise in this particularly simple extensive form game. What happens off of the equilibrium path has to reinforce what happens on the equilibrium path. In order for me to show that to you, let me adjust this game slightly. Let's suppose that we've got an incumbent that just loves campaigning. So instead of minus one happiness points for the campaign, let's give them one happiness point because they are ready to get themselves into a fight with this whippersnapper. They're not ready for Boca. They're ready for DC. They're going to the Beltway. They're not going to Boca. They're going to the Beltway. I should have gotten that the first time. Now, this is a completely different game. And if you make another matrix of it, you'll see that there's a particularly stark prediction of it once we just look at Nash equilibria. But I want to highlight the time point here. So let me show you the time point. 
So now that we have this new game, let's repeat our backward induction algorithm. All terminal nodes by definition are solved. I will write the word solved on them. Geez, you got a really obnoxious professor today, even though I was just obnoxious to you this morning in class. I observed that the challenger's decision node is not followed by only solved nodes because it is followed by the incumbent's decision node, which is not yet solved. However, the incumbent's decision node is followed only by solved nodes, those two terminal nodes. And so I will hone in on the incumbent's decision. Right now, the incumbent is thinking to herself, well, I can retire, go to Boca and get zero happiness points, or I can campaign and just trash this young whippersnapper that says, okay, boomer to me all the time and get one happiness point. I will campaign, thank you very much. So I will highlight that edge and I will consider this node solved. I will take that minus one one from the payoffs for, for that outcome and put them directly underneath the incumbent's decision node because that node might as well be a terminal node. That node is now solved. I now look for nodes that are followed only by solved nodes and we'll note that there's only one node left. And so we will now hone in on the challenger decision. Well, the challenger has one of two choices. The challenger can either opt out, they cannot run for office and get the zero happiness points for staying at home and playing PlayStation, and making YouTube movies, or, or they can run for office and they're looking down the tree and they've already thought through the fact that if they run for office, the incumbent will campaign and kick their ass and they will get minus one happiness points. They would rather opt out. They would rather not run. Now, notice with me that the equilibrium path of play just goes from the challenger's decision node down to the terminal node of the status quo, of, of nothing happening. However, that wouldn't be an equilibrium were it not for the fact that in the world that we never get to see, the unobserved world of, of the incumbent's decision, we never observed this, and yet it was decisive for the decision not to run. I'm doing it again. The challenge decision not to run was made thinking about this future that we never get to observe. Let that sink in. The equilibrium path of play is insufficient because we need to know what happens to make the equilibrium path of play the equilibrium path of play to begin with. What happens in unrealized worlds influences the world that we're observing. I'm suddenly tempted to go from this to this. And I got it going on today, right? Now, over in the C block, I'll be showing you a more rigorous definition of subgame perfection, and you'll see that it's not too much harder than this. The backward induction algorithm that I just showed you will identify subgame perfect equilibria. Not all subgame perfect equilibria can be found this way because not all games have terminal nodes to call solve to begin with. But this intuition is the most important thing of today's lecture. I don't really care if you know exactly what subgame perfection is. I don't really care if you're gonna be completely prepared for next week's lecture, which is just gonna twist your mind in ways you've never had them twisted before. I don't really care about that because that's all in the future and I can kick that can down the road. I care about the present intuition that what happens in unrealized futures influences what is best for you today. Credibility. That's how we exploit time in a sequentially rational way. That's how you take an extensive form game, take its predictions from the Nash land and say, oh, I didn't quite know what was gonna happen. And then think hard about how time influences the interaction. Think hard about who moves first and who moves second. Who is gonna actually have to live up to the threats that they make? And what we see is we are able to make completely sharp predictions. We went from multiple equilibria, in fact, three total if you include the mixing, to one and only one subgame perfect equilibrium. One and only one equilibrium that stands up to the fact that what happens in the future must be credible. Only one of our three equilibria encoded the idea that in order for something in the future to influence you today, it has to be something credible. Something that somebody would actually do if it came down to it. That's the idea. Now we'll see that that can get a little bit more complicated. And in fact, in the B block, it's about to get really complicated when we started the ultimatum game. I'm looking forward to that. See you there. Here in the B block, I wanna talk about the ultimatum game. So let's just remember what the ultimatum game is all about, okay? So in the ultimatum game, we've got two players. We're just gonna call them player one and player two, where player one makes some offer to player two. So, so player one is like, I'm gonna keep X of the dollar for myself, and you can get one minus X of the dollar. So remember, our visual depiction of the ultimatum game from the last lecture had strategic time go from top to bottom. And the idea here is that at the beginning of time, player one chooses some X that lives between zero and one. 
So they can choose x equals zero. They can choose x equals one. They can choose x equals one half. They can choose x equals one third or two thirds. They can choose uh, one fifth or two fifths or, or three fifths or whatever. They, they can choose all these numbers. They can choose all these numbers. There's a lot of numbers they can choose from. All these numbers are numbers that they could choose. Is that off center? That's off. I got to go like this. Ooh, that's ooh, it's like Pilates. And so they choose this X where the idea is that X is what proportion of the goodie they keep for themselves. How much of the dollar do they keep for themselves? They choose, they make this take it or leave it offer of X. That's how much they're going to keep for themselves. And then one minus X will go to, uh, to, to player two. So player two observes that offer. And then they've got a binary decision. They can either accept the offer, in which case we wind up with X and one minus X, or they can reject the offer, in which case we wind up at a disagreement point. And just to animate this introductory example, let's have the disagreement point be zero, zero. Zero happiness points for player one, zero happiness points for player two. So that if they fail to make a deal, something pretty crappy happens. Something as crappy as not getting any of the dollar. Exactly as crappy as not getting any of the dollar. Now, we have an extensive form game. And you'll remember from the problem set that I can come up with a Nash equilibrium prediction in simultaneous moves where any proposal could be supported and accepted in a Nash equilibrium. If you chose any proposal that lives between zero and one, if you chose any X that lives between zero and one, I can find a Nash equilibrium where that is the chosen offer and, and player two uh, accepts all offers there or lower. That's a Nash equilibrium if we view this as if it was simultaneous. But it's not simultaneous. We have a tree on our hands. And so let's use the backward induction algorithm to see if we can find any multiple zero subgame perfect equilibria, the strategy profiles that survive backward induction analysis. Okay, so what do I do? Well, I begin my analysis of backward induction by taking every terminal node and calling it solved. So every terminal node is solved, terminal nodes all solved. And now my job is to think through which decision nodes are followed only by solved nodes. We don't go straight from player one's decision straight to a terminal node. And so that's not the solved one. Instead, we need to focus on player two. So let's think about how many decision nodes we have to analyze in order for player two to be solved, right? So player two is the last player. Player two is the incumbent in this example. And so I wanna know how many different things are we gonna have to handle so that we can say that player two is solved and then we can go up to player one. Cause we got, we got, that's what we gotta do. We gotta go from the bottom up to the top. You pause the video now and tell me how many decision nodes are we about to have to solve? The drawing only has one because we show you one hypothetical X. But is that the only X? Pause the video and ruminate. Welcome back to all you ruminators. Okay, let's think about this. So notice that if X equals zero, if I offer you X equals zero, I'm player one and you're player two. If I offer you X equals zero, you have a decision node to make. You, you have a decision to make from X equals zero. Notice also that if X equals one, you have a decision to make. If X equals one half, you have a decision to make. If X equals a third or two thirds, you have a decision to make. If X equals a quarter or three quarters, you have a decision to make. Now that's just rational numbers I'm hinting at. If it's pi over one plus pi or one over one plus E, those are not rational, but they are numbers that fall between zero and one. Those are offers that I could make you. And at both of those offers, there exists a decision node for player two. Every one of these decision nodes is followed only by terminal nodes, which are solved by definition. And so every one of these is what we need to be focusing on. The problem is there's an uncountably infinite number of decision nodes for us to think through. The incumbent had one choice to make. If the challenger ran, they could go to Boca or they could go to the Beltway. That's gonna be my new bumper sticker. But here we have to think about an uncountably infinite number of contingencies for player two to think through. And I just told you that what happens in all of the worlds that we don't hit has to reinforce what happens in the world that we do hit, which means that we're about to be thinking our way through an uncountably infinite number of hypotheticals. Told you I was gonna bend your mind a little bit. Now, the thing is, we can't just go through one by one. It can't be like, okay, I'll handle the decision node at X equals zero. And you handle the decision node at one over 6.5 billion or however many people there are. 
and Chewie handles the one at two over 6.5 billion. We can't do that because we just jumped over an uncountably infinite number of decision nodes along the way. If you give me a little range, there's an uncountably infinite number of things in that little range. We can't crowdsource this thing because no matter how small we think that we make the jobs, they're all still huge. We can't make the job small enough to be thinking about these decision nodes one by one, group by group. We can't do that. There's too many. So what do we do? Let's think about it this way. Think about player two, which is you. Just in terms of the story, what player two is doing is they're observing X's, they see offers, and they have to think through every possible offer. They think through X equals zero, they think through X equals one, a third, two thirds. They're thinking through every possible X and they're thinking through what they would do there, right? So they see an X and they make a decision. They see an X and they make a decision. They see an X and they make a decision. You tell me the X, I tell you if I accept or reject. You give me the X, I tell you if I accept or reject. You give me an X, I tell you if I accept or reject. In other words, Player two's strategy reads in X's and spits out decisions. Player two's strategy is a function. You give me an X, I tell you if I accept or reject. It's the only way we can do this realistically with these uncountably infinite because we can't just like go through in the algorithm and say, solve, 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 because we just skipped over infinite, 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 infinite. Right? We have, to th we have to think of this strategy as a function so that we can think about how to get from any possible X to accept or reject. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say we have A sub two of X, A sub two of X, and that's gonna be a function that reads in the numbers between zero and one, inclusive, and spits out either accept or reject. We'll focus only on pure strategies. And that'll be enough for the record. If you wanted to, you could try this with mixing, but you're not gonna get anything new. Pure strategies will be enough for this. You'll see as we go deeper and deeper that pure strategies are what we focus the most on. Mixed strategies were just there to make you go through the same thing that everybody else ever went through. Also, sometimes it's the only time there's a solution. So right now, we have this function called a sub two of x, and what it's gonna do is it's gonna spit out the sequentially rational thing to do at any x. So it reads in an x and it spits out accept or reject, where the accept or reject has to be the best thing for them at the decision in question. And our job is to find that function. We need to find that function. We need to find the function that does this. We're not finding the choice. We're not finding the, we're not finding a number. We're finding a function. Okay, so, so let's think this through though. I think we can simplify this. I think we can simplify this pretty simply. Because think about any x that is not x equals one. So at x equals one, player one is keeping everything for themselves and player two gets nothing. But at any other x, x equals zero, x equals one half, x equals three quarters, x equals seven eighths, x equals nine tenths, whatever. At any one of those, one minus x, which is what player two gets out of this deal, one minus x will be bigger than the zero that they get for disagreement. So, so long as x is strictly less than one, if x is strictly less than one, then one minus X is strictly greater than zero, which means that the sequentially rational thing for player two to do at the decision nodes that come after X's that are strictly less than one, which is like all of them just about, right? It's all of them except for this one. All of these decision nodes were good. It's all of them except for this jerk, right? So all of the decision nodes that aren't X equals one, the X equals one decision node, every one of those, the best thing to do is accept accept the deal and get the something better than zero. It might be tiny. So X might be a Google over one plus a Google, which means that player one gets almost all the dollar and player two gets something probably close to imperceptibly different from X equals zero. But in our analysis, that's gonna be something that's strictly better than zero and therefore something that you would rather accept than reject. Every offer where X is strictly less than one, accept. This function is coming together pretty well. Now here's the question. What happens if X equals one, which is, the, which is the last X we need to solve? What happens when X equals one? Well, when X equals one, that means that one minus X is zero, which is exactly the same as, indif uh, as, the, as the disagreement point. Player two is indifferent between accepting and rejecting. 
If X equals one, player two is indifferent between accepting and rejecting, and therefore they are both part of the best response. We will have to consider those two contingencies separately. So we're gonna have two contingencies that we have to think through. It could be that they accept when indifferent. It could be that they reject when indifferent. It could be that they accept when X equals one or reject when X equals one. So that's all the function. We know everything that player two would do in every one of the uncountably infinite worlds that they might find themselves in, depending on the offer that player one makes to them. It wasn't that hard, right? We just, sometimes you just gotta be clever. You know, you don't have to brute force it, especially when it's not possible to brute force it. You can just stop and think and say, oh, that was actually a function all along. It reads and offers and it spits out accept or reject. You can consider every one of player two's decision nodes solved because we know what the sequentially rational thing there would be. Those are all solved. We can move up to player one. Ready, player one? Now let's think through player one. Player one is thinking, I want to make an offer where X is big. Player one likes big X's because big X's give them lots of happiness down the line. Their job is to think through what would happen at every offer they could make and to try to find the thing that offers them the highest utility conditional on what they expect player two to do down the line. So what I wanna do actually is I wanna focus primarily on player one's utility as a function of whatever X that they choose conditional on what they now know player two would do down the line. It's the same as in the A block, except that they have to think through a lot more contingencies, but it's the same basic idea. Look down the tree, assuming what you now know would happen down the tree, and then use what you learned from that analysis down the tree to make the best offer today. The first thing I wanna do is I wanna lock in one of the contingencies that we talked about when X equals one. We'll have to evaluate them, evaluate them separately. So let's suppose for now, that player two rejects the offer X equals one. They're the sort of person that you offer them X equals one. They say, I could get zero happiness point for accepting, zero happiness points for rejecting. Go to hell, I'm rejecting. They could be the sort of person that rejects when X equals one. Now, we have thought through what the strategy will be. Player two will accept any offer strictly less than one, but will reject X equals one. So now what I wanna do is I wanna plot on the, on the bottom axis, I'm gonna plot what is player one's offer, X. We're gonna put the X on this axis, and we're gonna put the utility that would happen if that X were offered, holding fixed the fact that that's what player two is doing. What's the equilibrium payoff for that X? I'm gonna mark a 45 degree line on this because a lot of this is gonna be riding the 45 degree line, it turns out. Now let's think through from left to right on the Xs. If X equals zero, that is accepted and player one gets X equals zero happiness points. If the offer is one tenth, that is accepted and player one gets one tenth of a happiness point. If the offer is one fifth, that is accepted and player one gets one fifth of a happiness point. If the offer is three tenths, that offer is accepted and player one gets three tenths of a happiness point two-fifths, one-half. Keep going, getting better and better. The higher the offer, when it's accepted, the more you get to keep for yourself. Now, I've been calling out numbers that are easy to remember, but it turns out that there's any X would do, right? So, so we're just riding this 45 degree line where I make an offer, it gets accepted, and I get to keep it. I make a bigger offer, it gets accepted, and I get to keep it. I make a bigger offer still, it gets accepted, and I get to keep it. I make a bigger offer still, still, it gets accepted, and I get to keep it. Bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and better and better and better and better and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and better and better and better and better and X equals one and you died. X equals one and they reject it and you wind up with zero happiness points. You fell off the mountain. That's what happens if player two rejects at X equals one. We, we go up, we go up, we go up, we go, we go up and we plop. Now here's the question, which X maximizes this function? If I asked you which X is the X that gets us to the top of this particular mountain, which X is that X? Tell me what is the X? Which X maximizes player one's utility? They're gonna make the offer that maximizes their utility. They wanna choose the X that maximizes their utility and I wanna know which one it is. 
pause the video. Welcome back to all you mountain climbers. Some of you may have figured out that this mountain doesn't have a top. There doesn't exist an X that maximizes this. There doesn't exist an X that maximizes this function. There isn't a top of this mountain. Why? Okay, well, suppose that you told me that you found it. You like, Rob, I have figured out what is the X that maximizes, what is the best offer that player one could make if player two is rejecting one indifferent. And I say, that's great, because we're probably gonna win a Nobel Prize for resolving this particular problem. Okay, so you say to me, it's 0.9. X equals 0.9. If X equals 0.9, that gets accepted and you get 0.9 happiness points. And I say, well, what about 0.91? And you say, oh, good point. Okay, it's 0.91. And I say, what about 0.92? And you say, oh yeah, that's right. Okay, how about 0.93? And so on. And so you get to 0.99. You get to 0.99. You're like at 0.99, that's it. And I said, well, what about 0.991? And you say, oh, good point. How about 0.999? And I say, what about 0.9991? And you say, oh, really good point. What about 0.9999? And I say, well, what about 0.99991? If you come up with a number that you think is the strictly largest number, strictly less than one, I can just take the average of your number and one, be higher than your number, be smaller than one, and therefore prove you wrong. There isn't a top of this mountain. There doesn't exist a best X to choose. There doesn't exist a subgame perfect equilibrium where player two rejects at X equals one because if there were such a thing, that would mean that player one is climbing an unclimbable mountain. Nope, not there, not there. We can rule out the idea that player two rejects at X equals one because if that were true, then that gives player one an unsolvable optimization problem. So let's go to the world where player two accepts because otherwise we're in a lot of trouble. Let's go to the world where player two accepts when X equals one because otherwise we're in like so much trouble, right? So if they accept when X equals one, let's think through player one's utility again as a function of X. X equals zero, accepted. X equals a third, accepted. X equals 63, 64, it's accepted. X equals one accepted. Accepted, 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 accepted. You can go all the way up the mountain and you wind up at X equals one and there you are looking at this beautiful vista of having maximized your utility. Look at the beauty of the Everest of utility. So we have found an equilibrium. In that equilibrium, player one offers X equals one and player two accepts their a, a star or a star of X is except for any X less than or equal to one. That's a sub game perfect equilibrium. It's also a Nash equilibrium of the style we had on the, on the uh, problem set. So we've gone from a game that has an uncountably infinite number of Nash equilibria if we view it simultaneously and sharpened that prediction to a unique prediction, a single prediction. If somebody said to me, hey, Rob, Here's an ultimatum game. Tell me what will happen. I just told you, that's it. Now, before I move on, let me stop on a point that it's like a hobby horse of mine. This is a real pet peeve. Because sometimes when you hear people talk about the ultimatum game, which is just gonna be a part of your life from now on, but sometimes you hear somebody say something of the following form. You have to assume that player two accepts when indifferent. You have to assume that, not so, not so. We didn't assume that, we didn't assume that. We allowed player two to reject when indifferent and we found that to be wanting. We found that to not lead us to an equilibrium. I didn't have to assume anything. It's a result the player two has to accept when indifferent. The only way we land at a steady state in this game when we take time into account, the only way for that to happen as a result, endogenously determined, is that you have to accept when indifferent. That's the only way we get to a steady state. It's not an assumption, it's a result. Now, throughout the rest of the class, I will say, and this is kind of like ultimatum, so let's just proceed where player two accepts when indifferent. But that's not my way of assuming it. That's my way of saying, oh, we've been through this together before, let's not split any more hairs because I can't afford to. So just make a note of that because it's gonna happen pretty often in future lectures where I'm like, and they accept when indifferent, they accept when indifferent for the usual reasons. And the usual reasons are not that we had to assume it. The usual reasons are that there was an unclimbable mountain. 
Now let's move on to some analysis of this equilibrium. You will notice that it is normatively repugnant. Why is it normatively repugnant? Well, you may have noticed that in the equilibrium, along the equilibrium path of play, player one gets everything and player two gets nothing. That's what we would call a first mover advantage. The first mover has the advantage here because they get to soak up all of the benefits in the bargaining range. Essentially what happened was we had a massive bargaining range because disagreement was so bad. And player one took advantage of that and they got to keep everything for themselves. Now for the usual sort of pennies in a coffee cup sort of reasons, that might strike you as unfair. And so my question to you is, if you could change one and only one thing about the ultimatum game as we just analyzed it, if you could change one and only one thing to get a perfectly egalitarian outcome, what would it be? If you could make an egalitarian outcome, what would you do? If you could change one and only one thing about the game that, as we've drawn it, how could you get it to be that the equilibrium outcome gets us to one half for player one and one half for player two? Pause the video. Welcome back. To all of you that have been sitting in the lotus position, stopping and reflecting, what you do is you give player two some bargaining power. You make their outside option a little bit better. That's how you counteract first mover advantage is to be really good at disagreement if you need to be. So I'm gonna change this game in one and only one way. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna say that if there's disagreement, if we fail to strike a bargain, if player two rejects the offer, then player two doesn't mind it all that much because they get one half of a happiness point. They don't get zero anymore. We just made their outside option better. We just made it easier for them to walk away from the deal. And I'm gonna say to you that that's gonna counteract, completely counteract the first mover advantage that we were just discussing. Let me show you why. So now we have this unsolved game. We acknowledge that what we're gonna do first is take every terminal node of the game, of which there's an uncountably infinite number of them, but every one of them, bim -ba -dim -ba -dim -ba -dim -ba -dim -ba, they're all solved. So now what we have to do is look for decision nodes that are followed only by solved nodes, and those are player two's uncountably infinite decision nodes. Player two has to make a decision that's a function. Their strategy is a function that reads in offers and spits out accept or reject. Now, let's think this through. If X is strictly greater than one half, then one minus X is strictly less than one half, which means that it's worse than disagreement point, that it's worse than disagreement for player two. In other words, if, if X is too big, if X is bigger than one half, so that player one is keeping most of the pie, then player two observes that X, looks at how much of the pie would be left over for themselves, and says, no thank you, disagreement sounds fine, I will reject that offer. So if X is seven eighths, that gets rejected because th that only leaves one eighth, which is worse than the half a happiness point that they get for rejection. If it's 0.51, they reject it because the 0.49 that they would get is worse. No matter what it is, if X is strictly greater than one half, player two will reject, no ambiguity. If X is strictly less than one half, then one minus X is strictly greater than one half. And so there's no ambiguity, player two would accept those offers. So if X is strictly less than one half, they accept. If X is strictly greater than one half, they reject. And if X is exactly equal to one half, that means that one minus X is exactly equal to one half, which means that player two is exactly indifferent between accepting and rejecting. We will have to consider both of those contingencies. And for the reasons I've just discussed, we will assume choo, 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 that player two accepts when indifferent. They accept that X equals one half. Why? Because I don't want an unclimbable mountain. And you're about to see a little mini mountain. So the sequentially rational strategy that we are evaluating for player two is that player two accepts offers that are where X is strictly less than one half, they reject offers where X is strictly greater than one half, and they accept at X equals one half as well, so I can have a climbable mountain. One nice thing about this obnoxious vernacular is it like sticks in your head a little bit. So now let's think about player one's decision. And again, we'll plot player one's offer X on this axis, and we'll plot their equilibrium utility on this axis. So let's just get things started by talking about what happens if X is strictly greater than one half. If we are to the right of the one half, if we're to the right of one half, then all of those offers are rejected. All of those offers get rejected. And that leads to the dis disagreement utility for player one, which happens to be zero, which is right along this bottom. If they make an offer strictly greater than one half, that gets rejected and they get zero. If conversely, they make offers smaller than one half, then by the analysis we just did before, 
If they offer X equals zero, that gets accepted and they get zero. If they offer a quarter, it gets accepted and they get a quarter. If they offer one third, that gets accepted and they get one third. If they offer one half, that gets accepted and they get one half. So we write up this mini mountain, get to the top at X equals one half, which gives player one, one half of a happiness point, And then we drop off to the zero of sea level. The single best thing for player one to do is to offer X equals one half. So now we've found a subgame perfect equilibrium of the following form. Player one offers X equals one half. Player two accepts offers strictly less than one half, rejects offers strictly greater than one half, and accepts the offer of X equals one half. We need to know all of those contingencies because all of those contingencies informed this plot that we just made. If, if player two had been accepting greater than one half, then the top of the mountain wouldn't have been where the top of the mountain was. If they had been rejecting smaller offers, then the top of the mountain wouldn't have been where the top of the mountain was. What player two is doing in the future influences what player one does today. You will notice that we have now created a, a subgame perfect equilibrium where the outcome is X equals one half, which is accepted. Therefore, player one gets a half a happiness point and player two gets a half a happiness point. We have counteracted the first mover advantage and generated a perfectly egalitarian outcome. Bargaining power mitigates the procedural advantages. If we're an institution that says that Rob gets the move first and you get the move second, that institution determines which of us enjoys first mover advantages. Th 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 those bylaws, that set of rules determines that. But none of that is enough to counteract the fact that you can just walk away if you want to and say, I'm not accepting any deals and I'm not that sad about it. And that's a credible threat. The credibility of player two's ability to walk away influences what kind of offers player one makes to them. Player one has to be careful. They have first mover advantages, yeah, but they have to think through which kind of offers player two would accept. Because essentially, player one, with their crappy disagreement point, wants to make the, the, an acceptable offer, and in fact, the best acceptable offer from their standpoint. But they don't want to make a rejected offer because then they wind up with zero, which sucks. But they have to think through player two's calculations. They have to think through what player two is going to do down the tree. So that's subgame perfection and ultimatum, where we introduced a couple of really important concepts and see how they work together. I can't make the, any promises that we're going to do anything heavier in the C block, but we will see some interesting wrinkles that emerge in the rule of law, which isn't quite as cool as this if you ask me, but tastes different, don't they? See you there. Here in the C block, I want to extend our machinery by talking about the rule of law game. So let's just revisit the rule of law game real fast. So the idea is that there's three players, a ruler and two factions in society. We'll call the ruler R and the two factions in society, faction A and faction B. And the idea is that the ruler can do something nasty to the people or not. And either way, the people can take to the streets and potentially coordinate on throwing the bastard out. And we use the rule of law game to introduce the notion of an information set last week. And we'll see that that additional apparatus requires some care and in fact, some theoretical clarity about what I've meant by subgame perfection throughout. And indeed what I've meant by a subgame. But before we get to all that, let's just reintroduce the model. So we'll have strategic time flow from left to right. At the beginning of time, the ruler can either decide to transgress the people or not transgress. They can do something nasty and take, or they can not take. They could be like, you know what? I'm going to need some more assets. That's mine now. Or in the case that you oftentimes see from, from, the, from the paper that this is from, sort of, the king might say, oh, remember that land that I sold you to, in order for me able to raise some money for myself because I was running out of money? Yeah, that's my land again now. So they can steal from the people or they can not steal. Regardless, faction A can then make a decision to try to, to, to challenge the leader or to acquiesce. And then after... That faction B can either challenge or acquiesce. So we wind up with eight terminal nodes. The ones with transgression, both challenge. Transgression, one challenges. Transgression, neither challenges. And then the same for if they don't transgress. So there's, there's eight outcomes. I spent some time talking through th where the utilities come from last time. 
and I'll just highlight that you could watch that video here. And I'll just fill in the numbers. I'll just fill in the numbers. And the idea is if, if the ruler takes from the people and doesn't get thrown out of office, they get eight. If they don't take and they don't get thrown out of office, they get two. And if they get thrown out of office, they get zero. The people, if they get to keep their stuff, get eight. Or if they manage to throw the ruler out, they get eight. But uh, going to the streets costs you a happiness point. Okay, so, so that's why we have like 822, 821, 077 is you threw the bastard out. You got to keep your eight things, but you had to spend a happiness point. And you'll remember the big development here was the fact that Faction B can't observe what Faction A did. Faction B and Faction A both get to observe what the ruler did, but they don't get to observe what each other does. Faction, Faction A doesn't get to observe what Faction B does because technically speaking, they move first. And Faction B doesn't get to observe what Faction A does because we have these information sets which are encoding the idea that they might not speak the same language, they might not be able to coordinate, they might not have, you know, sort of internet or something like that that allow, makes it easier to coordinate. They might not be able to go onto Facebook, whatever. So, so now tell me, since Player B doesn't know which decision node they're at, how are we going to go to the nodes that are followed only by solved nodes and then solve them? Because player B doesn't know which of the unsolved nodes that they control they're at. You'll notice that player B is the only player with decision nodes followed only by solved nodes. And I have no idea what we're going to do just yet. Because if faction B doesn't know if we're at the node after faction A challenged or the, fa or the node after faction A acquiesced, then how do we... How can we tell the story where then they, they observe what happened and then they chose? They, that doesn't happen. So in order to work around this, I want to be more precise about what I mean by a subgame. So a subgame is part of the game. I know it's hard to believe. So what a subgame is, is a, a chunk of the game. It's, it's a potentially smaller chunk. We'll see that the entire game is a subgame too. So it's a chunk of itself. A subgame is part of the game that has to follow certain rules. And the rules are as follows. One, a subgame must begin from a unique decision node. So we can't have a subgame with like two nodes at the top. A subgame, or on the left side. A subgame has to have a unique starting point. That's rule one. Rule two, a subgame must end only in terminal nodes. You can't like have a sub game that goes from one decision node to another decision node. It has to go all the way. And rule three, a, a sub game cannot tear apart information sets. If there's an information set, you can't have like part of it in the sub game and part of it not. The sub game has to contain all of a given information set. So what I'd like you to do if you have the chance is take this tree that we have in front of us and identify all of its sub games. And I've already given you a hint. The entire game is a subgame because it begins from a unique decision node, namely the ruler's decision, and ends only in terminal nodes. It also happens to respect the two information sets that we've got. I mean, technically speaking, we've got five information sets because there's like, Faction A knows exactly where they are in both times, and the ruler knows exactly where they are, which means that their information sets are just one tiny rectangle around their decision nodes. Every information set has been respected we begin from a unique node. We end only in terminal nodes. That's a subgame. But are there any others? Pause the video. Welcome back to all you subgame miners. There are two others. There are two other subgames. There are two subgames, and they both begin with Faction A's decisions. Faction A's decision, when transgression has happened, begins from Faction A's decision goes through the one information set of Faction B, which it respects, it doesn't tear it apart, and goes to those four terminal nodes. And the same for Faction A's decision after non-transgression. It goes, it, it crosses the two decision nodes contained in one information set by Faction B and goes on to those four decision uh, terminal nodes. There are three subgames in this game. Three subgames, three subgames. The big enchilada and then the two little enchiladas. I don't know where enchiladas came from. Now, when I say subgame perfect, what I mean is the following. For a set of strategies, one for every information set, that is subgame perfect if it's Nash in every subgame. So if we find the Nash equilibrium of every subgame of a game, 
and then treat every tiny sub game as solved within the set of all games that contain it, then what we've essentially done is taken this backward induction thing and allowed for multiple players to move at a particular point in time. So what we do in backward induction, if we're being completely precise about it, is we find the smallest sub game. We find sub games that aren't, that, that don't contain any other sub games. We solve them, we treat them as solved, and then we move up to the next nest of games. That's the idea. And so what I wanna do in order to find the sub game perfect equilibria of this model is find the smallest sub game, of which there's two, solve them, and then think about the ruler's decision looking forward to equilibrium play. Not sequentially rational as in you're at a node and you choose, but rather sequentially rational as in faction A and faction B find themselves in a coordination game and they choose, and then the ruler thinks about what they chose. Okay? So what I need to do first is I want to take the two small subgames and convert them back to matrices. Let's just go to the top subgame. We'll have faction A be the, the row player and faction B be the column player. I will note the ruler's utilities, but those aren't going to be what we're choosing over. So I'll put them like in a dashed or something. I'll, I'll make them, I'll make them noticeable as not part of the game right now. So faction A is this and faction B is this. And faction A can acquiesce or challenge and faction B can acquiesce or challenge. If they both acquiesce, then that's eight for the ruler and two apiece for the factions. If faction A acquiesces and faction B challenges, eight for the ruler, two for faction A, one for faction B. If Faction A challenges and Faction B acquiesces, eight for the ruler, one for Faction A, and two for Faction B. And if they both challenge, zero for the ruler and seven apiece for the two factions. And if I move down to the second small sub game, once again, Faction A can either acquiesce or challenge, and Faction B can either acquiesce or challenge. If they both acquiesce, that's two happiness points for the ruler and eight apiece for the factions. If Faction A acquiesces and Faction B challenges, two for the ruler, eight for Faction A, seven for Faction B, who are just protesting for no particular reason. If Faction A challenges and Faction B acquiesces, two for the ruler, eight for, uh, seven for Faction A and eight for Faction B. And if they both, if they both challenge, zero for the ruler, who's like, what did I do? And then seven apiece for the two factions. So now I've got these, I've taken these two sub games where essentially A can observe B and B can observe A, I'm treating them as if simultaneous. I'm treating them as if simultaneous because these are the smallest subgames, and any smaller and I would have had to tear information sets apart, right? So here I'm taking the information set really seriously and saying, if I can't tear the information set apart, then I have to treat this decision as if simultaneous. So what I want to do next is I want to go to these two subgames and find all of their pure strategy Nash equilibria. I just want to find their pure strategy Nash equilibria. Let's start with the bottom one, the world after non-transgression. This is this is easier because for both factions, it's better to acquiesce no matter what. So if we're in the bottom world, there's a unique Nash equilibrium in that subgame where faction A acquiesces and faction B acquiesces. And we wind up with the utility imputation of two for the ruler, eight for faction A and eight for faction B. That's the unique prediction. We can consider not this node solved, but rather this subgame solved. If, if the ruler chooses not to transgress, they can expect two happiness points. Things are a little bit more nuanced in the world where the ruler does transgress, because here there are two pure strategy Nash equilibria. In the first pure strategy Nash equilibrium, both factions acquiesce. The ruler gets eight and the two factions each get two. However, there's another Pure strategy Nash equilibrium in the in the top sub game, and in that one both challenge and they get seven happiness points apiece, and the ruler gets zero. There are two pure strategy Nash equilibria. Now, because there's two pure strategy Nash equilibria, we're going to treat that this sort of the same way that we treated indifference in the ultimatum game. We're going to say that either of those could play out, either of those is possible, either of those is a candidate to be part of a sub game perfect equilibrium. But what happens in the non-transgression world and what happens in the transgression world, which is a little bit ambiguous now, that has to reinforce what the ruler does. So now that we've solved both subgames, on the understanding we'll have to consider two contingencies for the top subgame, let's zoom out to the big subgame, the whole enchilada, and study what the ruler would like to do. So for now, let's suppose that the factions 
acquiesce. They, they play the acquiesce, acquiesce equilibrium if there's transgression. So let's just, let's just hold that thought for a second. So right now we're saying the acquiesce, acquiesce equilibrium is the one that we're playing in the top sub game. And the acquiesce, acquiesce equilibrium is the only equilibrium in the bottom sub game. So now the ruler is thinking, well, if I transgress the people, and that's what rulers do right before they transgress, is they draw a game tree and they say, okay, I'm about to transgress. Let's think this through. More on this in the provocative thought. So the ruler is looking down the tree and they're thinking, well, if I, if I transgress, they're both going to acquiesce because they can't coordinate or something. They, can't, they don't know how to coordinate on challenging. They're both going to fold like a house of cards and I get eight happiness points. And if I don't, then they fold like a house of cards anyway and I get two happiness points. I would rather repress. I'd rather transgress. And so if the ruler expects to see mutual acquiescence, if transgression, then transgression happens. And we wind up with a subgame perfect equilibrium where the ruler transgresses. If transgressed, both factions play acquiesce. And if not transgressed, both factions play acquiesce. The equilibrium path takes us transgress, uh, acquiesce, acquiesce, which takes us to that 822. But you'll notice that lots of things have to happen off of the equilibrium path to reinforce what happens on the equilibrium path. Now, let's hold the thought that if transgressed, the two factions in society will instead coordinate. They will choose the equilibrium that's Pareto optimal for them. They, they'll take the 7-7, seven, seven, thank you very much. They will manage, if they could manage to coordinate, if they, if they manage to choose the stag hunt outcome, if they both go for the stag, right? The 7-7 seven, seven beats the 2-2, two, two. it's the stag hunt, except for factions that are angry at a transgressing ruler. So let's suppose, let's just hold the thought that if transgressed, they manage to play the challenge challenge equilibrium. And now let's zoom out to the big enchilada and say to ourselves, what will the ruler do? Well, the ruler is thinking to themselves as they talk to their scribe, uh, well, if I transgress, then they're going to throw me out and I get zero happiness points. And if I don't, they both acquiesce and I get two. I will choose not to transgress. I will be the nice ruler. Thank you very much. So they don't transgress. We find a second pure strategy subgame perfect equilibrium wherein the ruler doesn't transgress. If transgressed, the factions in society both challenge. And if not transgressed, which is what winds up happening, they acquiesce. In other words, the nasty thing from the ruler standpoint that happens off of the equilibrium path deters them from being nasty. That's why you need the entire contingency plan. That's why you need to study every decision node and not just the ones that seem relevant for the equilibrium path of play. That's why backward induction has to cover the entire tree and not just the path. What happens in the worlds we don't see has to reinforce what happens in the worlds that we do see. If you expect the people to acquiesce, then you should transgress them. Not should, but you know what I mean. And if you expect them to challenge, then you should not transgress them. There, go be a ruler. I just taught you everything you need to know about being a ruler. Two, pure strategy, subgame, perfect equilibria depending on which equilibrium we would expect to see out in the wild if the people are transgressed. And it's not that hard to imagine some societies being those where transgression, where, where challenging is easy to coordinate on and other societies where it's not so easy to coordinate. And the idea of this model is that that is the hinge. That is the thing that tells us if we wind up in a world of transgression and nastiness or non-transgression and niceness. That's the hinge. If it goes one way, nasty. If it goes the other way, not so nasty. That's what the whole thing turns on. And we know that because now we've taken the future into account. We've taken multiple futures into account. We've taken multiple counterfactual worlds, the world with repression and the world without it. We've thought them through very hard. We've thought through all the futures and we've seen that the answer is somewhat contingent, but it's contingent on substantively interesting things like whether or not people can coordinate if transgressed. That's the power of an analysis like this, is the ability to think through the future, think about what's credible, and then think about how people would react to credible things, be they threats or promises. Carrots or sticks. That's the whole point. There's a reason that we all wonder where credible commitment comes from. It's important in politics, but it's important in trees. And if you get pretty good at this, then I think it, it's going to help you to make better decisions in your own life because... You'll stop listening to cheap talk. You'll stop listening to threats that aren't credible. You'll stop 
accepting promises that nobody will ever keep. That's what this looks like. Don't be afraid to sketch out a tree now and again. You're the ruler of your own tiny little world. I just hope it doesn't involve any, I don't know, fighting in the streets. So what do we talk about today? I mean, disparately, we talked about all sorts of different things. We talked about why people run for office. We talked about how to make offers when you're bargaining. And we talked about how to be a ruler. Other than that, we didn't cover that much ground. But more importantly, we talked about how time and sequential rationality go together. We introduced time into our fables last week, and it was a lot of fun. And you're like, fun's a strong word. Shut up. So it was a lot of fun, because I said so. And it, wait, Chewie is really saying hi. Sorry about that. Hey, shut up! Works every time. So, time was fun to work into our fables, but I think it's even more fun to work into our analysis, right? So remember, what a story is and how it ends are two different things. And so we had these time-respecting fables where we could see some tension emerging, but we didn't know what to make of that tension. And that got resolved today, in part. You'll see next week. And we saw that when we incorporate time not just into the fable but in terms of how we get to the ending of the fable there's a lot of meat there we we, we took what had been these indeterminate messy predictions potentially in, in simultaneous analysis and then once we breathed life into our characters in a time respecting way we were able to really crisp up those predictions and what's more identify some really important substantive tensions that arise. Credibility. Don't listen to threats that nobody's going to live up to once we get to them. Make sure you take into account which equilibrium you might be able to expect from the people. Think through whether or not somebody seems like a pliant bargaining partner. All of these factors, these little features in the model, they played a pretty big role in the in the punchlines too. So I think that we, we took time, it, we put it into the story, we put it into the analysis, but what we got was more than just those two injections. The time hole was more than the sum of the time parts. Now, we'll be living here most of the time from here on out. We'll be living in, in sequential games. There will be some exceptions along the way as we introduce incomplete information in slow and then fast ways. But I want these concepts to be something that you really internalize because these are the concepts that will probably serve you the best in other classes. What rationality is, very important. What best response is, very important. What a steady state is, very important. But you're going to see terms like credibility quite a bit in your readings in other classes. It's going to be really important, not just for game theoretic papers, but in any paper. Because everybody worries about having a promise not kept. Everybody worries about whether or not a threat is going to be something that gets carried out. Everybody worries about the future. It's just that only the people that live in our fake worlds worry about the future the way that we hypothesize today. Now, you might be thinking to yourself that these robots that we talk about in these games, these people that we find on our screens, these people are not real people. And you might be thinking to yourself, well, it's great that we were able to think through the uncountably infinite contingencies in the ultimatum game. Or it's great that the ruler was able to sit down with their scribe and figure out all the potential contingencies of the factions of society. But that isn't how people really work. This is entirely too smart. You might be thinking that what happened in the A, B, and C blocks of today's lecture for various reasons required the players to be a little bit smarter than you think that they ought to be. Now, this, they don't seem smart enough to think through all those contingencies, seems different than they're not really rational. They're not really rational is like, are they capable of having complete and transitive preferences? But this is just more like, do people really think through things that hard? Now, it's reasonable to wonder about that as well, but it seems qualitatively different, right? Now we're not just thinking about rational in an exhaustive sense, but almost like in a smart sense. It's like, are they smart enough to do all of this? And you might be thinking that real flesh and blood humans like us aren't smart enough to live up to the tenets of subgame perfection as we just introduced them. And it's with your hubris in mind that I'd like to conclude with a provocative thought. One of my favorite economists is, uh, her name is Deidre McCloskey. Uh, first of all, she's one of the best writers I've ever read. And if you ever have a chance to read her prose, you should read it. It's elegant and lucid and beautiful and stylish, even though it's also academic. And truth be told, one reason I've learned so much from her is because I enjoy reading her prose so much. But she wrote something one time that really influenced me. And she wrote it in the context of macroeconomic theory. 
In the 1970s and 1980s, there was a somewhat dominant paradigm, and it's still an influential paradigm, although it's been worked into other paradigms, but the idea at the time was called rational expectations. And the idea was you might have a decision maker in some market. Let's say that it's a farmer that's in some agricultural market. And if they're faced with an infinite time horizon, they're thinking about how much of their stuff to plant today versus how much to save for tomorrow. And they have to think through all of these this infinite time horizon. They're making all of these difficult decisions about when to plant and how much to plant and how much to save for the future. There's this very dynamic decision problem that the farmer faces if they're operating under rational expectations in a classic neoclassical macroeconomic model of the 70s and 80s. These models won several economist Nobel Prizes. They've influenced policymakers. They're part of the models that are used by the Federal Reserve when trying to figure out what's going to happen in the future as they try to satisfy their mandates. This rational expectation school is highly influential. And in, in these models, a decision maker or a set of decision makers is making a really smart decision. They're thinking through an infinite time horizon and within every moment in time, they're thinking through a complicated decision problem. And you might be thinking to yourself, well, I know some farmers. I know some farmers too. And you might be thinking a lot of the farmers that I know don't think that hard. They don't live up to the rationality postures. They don't live the way that the people on the screens or in the fake mathematical worlds are. My question to you is what makes you think that? Let me pose the question slightly differently. And this was McCloskey's point. She was like, what makes the economist think that the economist knows something that the farmer doesn't? All this fancy school, all this fancy math, all these fancy models, all this fancy analysis. But there's an underlying hypothesis. There's an underlying hypothesis where if you say that if a farmer doesn't live up to all the fancy, the fancy and the fancy and the fancy and the fancy, then that means that the economist knows something that the farmer doesn't. That means the economist is modeling about something that is bigger than just the farmer's silly little problem. And that's some of the dumbest shit I've ever heard. There is nothing that an economist knows about a farmer's decision problem that the farmer doesn't already know. The model, the fable, is the economist's plea for understanding. It's the economist's way to try to figure out what's going on. It's their way to try to say, well, if I envision it this way, I see a bunch of different outcomes. Do those go happen in the world? How can I use this to learn about the farmer? And if we're viewing things that way, then that means that the economist, the analyst, the god of the world has no choice but to equip the farmer with all of the intellectual assets that the economist, the analyst, the god of the world has too. The only way that the god of a world would make the person in that world ignorant is if they knew something that they wanted the person not to know. In the absence of that animus, why should we let the economist, the analyst, the god of the world know anything that the farmer doesn't? And when I read, I, I, she wrote this like in a sentence or two. It's like a short paragraph. I'll, I'll find the paragraph. And when she wrote it, I just went, Psh! because it helped me to understand that what we're doing here is not meant to be too proud. It's meant to be a plea for understanding. Now, it's true that the things that we write down might not be particularly realistic. The rational expectation school, or even just sequential rationality, it might be true that the models that we write down don't comport with the decisions that farmers or candidates or bargainers or rulers or faction leaders actually make. It might be that we simplify things so much that things are too simple. It might be that we complicate things so much that things are too complicated. But in both cases, that's the analyst's problem, not the farmer's. 
not the incumbents, not the challengers, not the bargainers, not the rulers, not the factions. That's the analyst problem. It's something that kind of bugs me, to be completely honest with you. It's something that kind of bugs me when people look down on the things that they study. Now, you are mostly political science majors, and I'm a political science major too. There's all sorts of different people that we can look down on as we study them. They might be voters, they might be politicians, they might be rebel groups, they might be firms, they might be the members of international organizations. There's all sorts of people that you could look down on, or you could try to understand them. And I think that this point of the of the class, this, this part where the analysis is starting to get a little bit too far, you might think, where you're like, I don't think the people actually look down trees that way. Why the hell not? Do you think that you know something they don't? Do you think that I know something they don't? Because I can assure you, I don't. And I'd like to think that you think that you don't too. I'd like to think that some mix of curiosity and humility makes you want to learn more but to understand that you always have something more to learn and not just from some stupid professor. You have made decisions up to this point in your life that I have no hope of understanding. And that doesn't make them stupid just because I'm some rational game theory professor or something. It has nothing to do with that. You made your choices and I hope you feel great about them. I might show you some interesting tensions that popped up along the way. I might be able to use my somewhat refined palette and all this to, to, to call your attention to particular things or to show you particular concepts where there's choices that you've made, the concept helps to relate your choices to somebody else's choices. But that's the same thing as me saying, oh, that isn't a good decision. Oh, you made a stupid decision. Oh, you're not being rational. Oh, some stupid farmer isn't living up to the expectations. But I don't believe that. There's just too much to learn. And the moment that you stop thinking that way, the moment that you think that you know something that the people you're trying to understand don't, then you're in a pretty bad worldview if you ask me. All this to say, don't be too proud. Don't let the math make you think that you've got silver bullets. All that they gives you is tools to try to understand. And this plea for understanding, this really deep attempt to understand not just other people, but also ourselves, this introspection and extrospection are both super important parts of being a socially conscious human being. So keep your chin up, but not too high. This is one reason I really enjoy the problem sets, because I get to see you think you understand something and then not quite understand it, and then ask questions, and then plea for more understanding. And by the end, it seems to me that you have no judgment about the people that are involved in these stupid fables. I'd like to see you keep it that way. But no matter what, we have another problem set to work our way through, and it's something where I think that you'll learn a lot about how the shadow of the future influences decisions today, whether it's by implausible robots or just some farmer that you know. Regardless, I'm looking forward to going through it with you. I hope you are too. But in the meantime, thanks for watching.